Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. Relative the acceptance of Bitcoin, and shall identify an appropriate third party payment processor that will process Bitcoin transactions at no cost to the state. So it's big enough where we have the option to choose, you know, a company like BitPay or a company like ZipperCoin. That's that's going to be up to the state treasurer and and the respective parties to decide uh, what they think makes uh, makes best sense. Uh, but I did make sure to put that the state must use a third party payment processor, and also that they must make they must set that up at no cost to the state. So if any third party payment processor wants to charge New Hampshire, we're not gonna use them because there's plenty of companies that will do it for free for us. So third party payment processors eliminate any kind of risk to the state of New Hampshire. Uh, originally, the way I had written the bill, uh, originally before it actually became a house bill when it was still an LSR, I did not have that in the bill and it was actually you know, uh, Speaker Jasper who had uh, sent me a message on Facebook, and he said, you know, I'm concerned about uh, the volatility risk. You know, we should be basically gambling with Bitcoin. I agree. We should, with the state should not be gambling in any other kind of uh, currency, uh, property, whatever you call it. We should only be holding U.S. dollars. We shouldn't be speculating. We shouldn't be gambling. So I addressed that, and I addressed those concerns, and from... Uh, from that line where it says the acceptance of Bitcoin and shall identify an appropriate third party payment processor that will process Bitcoin transactions at no cost to the state. That's not we might find a third party payment processor. That means we must find a third party payment processor and we must do it at no cost to the state. So I just wanted to be crystal clear that the bill as it's written right now, it's vague enough where we have the option where, you know, let's say we go ahead and use BitPay and then we find that we don't like working with them, we can switch to another payment processor. It's very similar to, you know, if you have a credit card and you don't like working with Visa, you can switch to Discover, you can switch to MasterCard. So it, so that, so that sort of, um, I guess I want to say in a, in, in, in it, it's, it's, uh, it's vague enough where we have the option, but it's also concise enough and specific enough where we've ensured that we're not risk, we're not taking any kind of currency risk. We're not. This prevents us from speculating any kind of currency, and we also have the advantage of unlike a credit card, where it can take several days to process. This is instant conversion, where we'll we'll get the U.S. dollars right away. So there's plenty of advantages of implementing the system, and I just want to stress again, we would be doing something at zero cost to the state. This this will cost taxpayers nothing, not a zero. And again, we have zero risk, no risk to the state. Uh, and I'm, I'm open to questions. Questions from the committee, Representative Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony this morning. Uh, you said there would be no cost to the state. Correct. Um, so how does this third party payer get paid? They're not working for nothing, Correct. obviously. Yeah, so I know I know. with, I'm not sure with ZipterCoin's model, I'm, I would say definitely ask the CEO because he's here today. Oh. Uh, when it comes to BitPay, my understanding is they make money from some from some kinds of customer service. They also did make clear to me though that when working with the state of New Hampshire, they would implement that, and of course that would be on a contract completely free of charge. We wouldn't work the way the bill is written. No company can work with us unless they charge us nothing. And a company like BitPay has been willing to do that. Um, I'll let ZipterCoin speak for their company, uh, but I'm pretty sure they're willing to do that too. So there's there's no setup cost and there's no transaction cost. It just sometimes like so BitPay works for Microsoft. They will charge Microsoft fees for like you know customer service and implementation costs. They're not doing. They would not do that with the state of New Hampshire. They would waive all those charges as a way to get more name exposure. Let me understand this. Sure. So if a customer, if somebody owes the state one thousand mm dollars, -hmm. and they go through BitPay, mm -hmm. then BitPay then pays the state one thousand dollars in U.S. money. Correct. Instantaneously. Representative Mr. Mr. Chairman, and, um, that to me is somewhat confusing in the word. Okay. It appears that it says we use a third party 
And to me, it looks like we would take bitcoins. And so your explanation is we get US dollars. Whoever has the bitcoin and wants to make the payment transfers those bitcoins to the third party. That makes perfect sense. Yes. But the wording here just is a little confusing to me that that would happen. It appears that the state would accept bitcoins. Okay, yeah, so. So, so where it says the acceptance of, shall identify an appropriate third party payment We're process. Sorry, I'm sorry. Six and seven. It's uh, six and seven on the bill. Okay. So when it says that will process Bitcoin transactions at no cost to the state, mm -hmm. if I if I'm the treasurer, if I'm the treasurer, it would be appropriate for me to accept U.S. dollars. So it gives, you know, I'm not I'm not going to want to convert it to euros or convert it to yen. So. I think the the obvious currency of choice to to convert it would be U.S. dollars. You know, if you, if you wanted to make that language more more specific, where you, you know you, you wanted to say, uh, let's just say third party payment processor that will pro process Bitcoin transactions and convert it to U.S. dollars in no cost of the state. If you thought that might be appropriate to add, you know, obviously. The answer you gave me is that tells me that we're not dealing. With, we're not. You will never have to deal with Bitcoin. Actually, it goes so far to all you need. Is, all you need is a bank account. So, the state of New Hampshire already has a bank account. You'll never need to hold a Bitcoin wallet or anything. So, you recommend putting an amendment in? Yeah, if you if you want to just say put an amendment that just specifies what will we'll, uh, be converting to U.S. dollars, I think that might sound pretty reasonable. You know, so you don't have some rogue treasurer wanting to convert to yen one day, <laughs> but. What would be the reason for the uh, treasurer to get involved? Then? Well, uh, who, whoever is, in, whoever be, I think it'd be the treasurer, who's ever in charge of, at the state level, implementing a system, you could choose to, to convert it to U.S. dollars. So I, I, would, I think that would just be the, the natural currency of choice. If, if, that, if that made the committee more comfortable to specify we converting it to U.S. dollars, sure, that might be appropriate. Representative Southworth. Thank you. Um, do you have the description that's at the beginning that we have? I'm sorry. Back uh, on page one. What, is your, what does it say? It says requiring the state treasurer to develop an implementation plan for the state to accept Bitcoin as payment. That's really not what you're asking. Yeah, that's true. That's the the analysis is actually confusing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why you're getting these questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's also yeah line for the bill. Line four. For the state to accept Bitcoin as payment for that. Yeah, it is, it, the way it's worded is confusing because there is that inclusion. I would recommend I would recommend that an amendment so that this isn't, you know, so this isn't as confusing. I Thank agree. you. Yeah. Would you agree that if that's the case, we don't need to have the treasurer get involved in this? I don't know exactly how the administrative side of the of of our government works. I don't know who the specific. I'm assuming it's the treasurer, but I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. President, oh, I'm sorry. I, tell me because I kind of forgot her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I should think either DAS would be the one that would work, have to work this out. But, um, I wanted to ask you about on um, having one processor. Mm -hmm. um, usually, unless it makes sense for economic reasons, this, we don't like to create monopolies, and this would be a monopoly for the processor. So what are the reasons that we want, more, want only one processor? Um, I I, 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 I'm not saying you should have one or three or, I don't, I don't know. I'm so there, there isn't a specific reason, perhaps, uh, the gentleman who's coming up has Yeah, he, he might have a better answer to that. Thank you. Okay. And Representative Lehman, uh, what chance? I'm all set, thank you. Okay, Minister. you're all set, Representative Salzburg? Yes, thank you. Representative Henry. Thank you. Uh, why do you need this bill? Why do I need this bill? Yeah. Why can't you just pay in Bitcoin now, the way you're saying? I mean, why can't you call Bill Pay and say, "Please pay my thousand dollars," and Bill Pay gives us a thousand dollars? 
Because they have to, the state has to have that um, payment processor in place. So like for instance, there are companies, like Apple, right? If I want to buy something through like the iTunes music store, they now accept Bitcoin. So they have it, they have it set up with a third party payment processor where I can go to the, the app store, purchase something, and do it instantly in Bitcoin. If I'm to go to pay some fee or tax in New Hampshire, there's no mechanism right now in place and New Hampshire is a state where we have the highest um, amount of Bitcoin users uh, per million. We have to so, but, uh, I, I, so it provides them a service. Follow up. Yeah. Um, it seems if we need to do something to make this happen, we're going to be touching Bitcoin. And if we're not going to be touching Bitcoin, why do we have to do anything? I mean, we'd be perfectly happy to have your friend show up with $1,000 and pay your bill for you. And if he gets, you know, so I, I just don't see why we need to do anything. Why can't you pay with Bitcoin now through a third party vendor who will, you know, pay your bill for you with dollars? I just, maybe you could defer that question to, to Zifter Coin, but I don't think that's just how the, the processing system works. Just like if I wanted to, you know, make a transaction through PayPal, if, if that, uh, company doesn't have that PayPal link set up, I can't click a button and do it. Um, or, you know, if, if, a, if a company doesn't accept credit cards and I have a credit card, if they don't have a, um, a machine to do it, then my credit card really doesn't make much sense. Yes, I can go to the ATM and pay a fee, but it, it creates a whole, uh, it just creates a bunch of extra steps. And So I want to provide a service to a state where we have the most Bitcoin users per, per million than any other state in the country. So if New Hampshire could lead the way in, in you know in the in the primary process, and we can lead the way in in other ways. Why don't why don't we lead the way in being the first state uh, to actually implement a processor? It's going to happen eventually. It's at some point all 50 states are going to have this. Why don't we be the first? Follow up and different different questions. Sure. Um, this is kind of like sound crass, but sure, anything you know, yeah. there's got to be something in it for the state of New Hampshire, and I, I think. My feeling is, you know, where's the, what's in it for us, you know, besides goodwill? I mean, you know, we're the ways and means, we're in the revenue here. Mm -hmm. You know, is there, can we get a piece of the action somehow? I mean, that'll help you a lot if, you know, we can go to the full house and say, we're going to make a little money on this. Yeah, I have a question there. Yeah, is there any way we can make a little money on this? I'm, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speculate on, um, how much revenue is going to come from Bitcoin? That's obviously going to be pretty low right now. But the thing is, it's not going to cost us anything. There's a, I have a background in investing, and there's a, there's a guy named Monish Pabrai. He wrote an awesome book called The Dondo Investor, and he talks about the word Dondo, and it's an it's an Indian term. And he says, you know, uh, he makes the analogy in investing. He says, heads you win, uh, tails you don't lose much, or in some cases, tails you still win a little bit. This is a case where. The future is heads, right? At some point, there's going to be a lot more Bitcoin users than there is today. The, the downside is there's no downside. There's, there's, there's no cost. We're not spending any money to implement this. And there's going to be a little upside at the beginning. So we, we put infrastructure in place that costs us absolutely nothing. I, I, don't see there's, I just don't see why we wouldn't do this when we have, we're taking no risk and we're, we're offering a method of payment that is cheaper than credit cards more secure than credit cards and has a faster convert uh, and we get paid faster than credit cards. So I, I think to me it, it, it's just a logical, sensible and rational piece of legislation that doesn't inherently, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a big money maker, if, at least right now, but that's not why I'm introducing this bill. So, so I, I, in this case it's just not going to cost us anything. Look, if this costs us money, I would I would not be for it right now, but it's not costing us money. So. Representative Lehman, followed by Representative Lehman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, there are other nations around the world that accept the American dollar as their standard monetary unit. Mm -hmm. One of them I happen to know personally is Ecuador, okay. a country I've studied very thoroughly. And they accept the American dollar as the same valuation as we do here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so how would this affect a country such as Ecuador or any other country? Well, would they be required to follow? I'm talking about the state of New Hampshire. Right. Okay. 
I would draw my follow-up. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Holmes. Thank, and thank you, Representative, for your uh, responses to all our many questions. Yeah, I've got yet another question. Um, you talked about no risk to the state. Yes. And I just want to make sure my understanding of Bitcoin is correct. That Bitcoin is a commodity, as determined by the IRS, is something that has to be sold on exchange to convert to U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. correct? It's sold. It's yeah. It's on. You can get it on exchange. Correct. Yeah. But the only way to convert a Bitcoin to dollars is through an exchange. There's, I would, I would ask that you could defer that question to the CEO of Ziftercoin, so that so that they can explain how the conversion actually works. Any further questions? Oh yes, grab some alumni. There are three states, to my knowledge, now that have recognized Bitcoin in some way in their laws that is mostly trying to figure out how to charge on in on in the earnings of the company how much it's going to be worth in dollars so they can tax it. Uh, is there any state that is looking yet at this? Looking at or any what like what we're state? doing? Yes. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe so, which is one of the reasons this bill has gotten a lot of attention in the press. Any further questions? Thank you for your testimony. Just one quick one. Are there any states that have uh, rejected Bitcoin? I know New York has some awful, I don't know the exact details, but I know if you talk to anyone in the Bitcoin community, Apparently, New York has done some atrocious things in terms of trying to, to regulate it out of existence, but I don't know the exact details of that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Next is Bob Williams from Norfolk, Vermont. You have a written testimony. You don't. Bob Williams, who is I mean, here. Yes, I have a little bit. You do not indicate whether you're for or against I'm actually, I am for the bill. Did you sign this? You're up. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a, a brief outline. I'm just going to hit a couple passages on my testimony. I think are pertinent based on some of the questions you I've heard here today. Testimony? Sorry? You said you have a written testimony? Yes. And is it passed out? Oh, no, I was going to read the testimony. Is that I can provide a copy if you like. Okay. Is that fine? Uh, okay, my name is Bob Wilkins. I'm from Peterborough, New Hampshire. I have a company in Milford, New Hampshire called Zifter. Zifter has been around since 2008. We have 36 employees. We've raised over $7 million in capital. We created a shopping engine that uh, right now services about two million customers. I have been an executive entrepreneur since the early 80s. I've personally uh, started six different companies. I've had two IPOs. Uh, most recently here in New Hampshire, I was president and EVP of PC Connection for 11 years. and saw its growth through a tremendous part of the state through 2006. So I have a big background in the tech industry and in creating jobs and creating income and so on. Our company, Zifter, moved into the cryptocurrency space about a year and a half ago. And I personally moved our company into this because as a tech person, I became um, fascinated with what the technology behind Bitcoin can do, which is really a thing called a blockchain. If anybody has questions about that, I can get into that a little bit. It's called what? The blockchain. The, blo the blockchain is really what most venture capitalists and most technology people are very excited about. This is the first time that we've been able to move information back and forth between us, everybody in this room, in a peer-to-peer -peer network and have it validated by ourselves. We don't need a central repository to validate the information of exchange. And right now we think about that information of exchange as a token called a Bitcoin. But there's many other purposes to this technology. We could exchange titles, we could exchange deeds, we can exchange lots of different things without having one central place be the repository or the authority that says, did we receive this or did we send it? 
And that's really the power behind Bitcoin. I want to read a statement off the top this I think will help in why we're very excited about this. Bitcoin has never been broken. There are, however, have been many companies in the Bitcoin ecosystem they have been broken into and coins were either lost or stolen. This has nothing to do with Bitcoin security. It has everything to do with the companies who were broken into and their security policies. Just like Target, Home Depot, and many larger companies exposed people's credit card information to hackers, this had nothing to do with the credit card companies. The breach had to do with the company's security around its user information. Now, if the same companies had been taking Bitcoins for their services and a hacker was able to get into their systems, for those customers who had used Bitcoins, there's that security breach wouldn't have mattered. Why? Because cryptocurrency is a send-only protocol. There's no number left behind. There's no number like a credit card that can be charged over and over again. This makes cryptocurrency much more secure for the consumer and the merchant taking cryptocurrency. The state today pays fees to the credit card processing companies. It also has a huge administration fee associated with chargebacks and credit card fraud. We need to add all those factors into it. We like to think credit cards fees are around 25 to 3%. When you add all of your administration costs into it, like we did PC Connection, it actually is almost 5 to 6% of your cost in taking a credit card today. Centralized repositories are actually more vulnerable to attack than you might think. Take the latest break-in in banks this weekend in Russia, Eastern Europe, and in the U.S. in which over one billion was lost. A central repository system that depends on one area is a weak link. What Bitcoin does and the blockchain does is it removes the weak link. It is, it is never, Bitcoin or the blockchain has never been broken into as a very secure protocol a very fast protocol for us to do transactions on it and lowers operating costs. So all the things around security and so on should be, should be taken out of, of the thought process. This is a much better way to do business than the current processes we have today. Now, the question comes into this token called a Bitcoin, and there are other types of coins out there. We call altcoins that have their own tokens, Litecoin and Dogecoin and Zipcoin. And the question is, well, how do we move these into a monetary system? Because the state doesn't want to hold on to Bitcoins or Doge. They want cash. They want US dollar. So the way the exchange process works and the way Zifter Pay works is just like today when you go on and a user is going to use a credit card, instead of putting in a credit card information and all the personal information around that credit card that's now held and can be recharged, a Bitcoin is sent. It's sent through our system. So same thing, you press on a button on a website, instead of putting a credit card information in, you put in your, your Bitcoin address number. When that Bitcoin address is sent through the Zifter Pay system, we actually move that to over 11 different exchanges. And we bid on who's going to give us the best price for the consumer. So if the Bitcoin price is $200 at that instant in moment, it could be $200 on one exchange, it could be $190 in another exchange, it could be $210 on another exchange. We take the averages and credit the consumer for that in U.S. dollars. It's immediately sold. It is gone. Now we have U.S. dollars in our process, and the U.S. dollars are then moved to the state for the goods and services that were just sold. The consumer ended up getting the best average of the pricing that Bitcoin's being sold at at that point, not the lowest, not the highest, but they were able to move their Bitcoins through. The state got US dollars and they lost the costs associated with processing credit cards, that two and a half to three percent, plus the administrative cost of chargebacks. Who makes that decision that they're going to use the average? We do. So in our case, Zipter Pay uses the average. But well, the question came up to how do companies like BitPay and ZifterPay make money? We make some of our money on the exchange rate. So we're, we're offering the consumer an average. If I was a consumer today and just wanted to sell my Bitcoin first for U.S. dollars and then take the U.S. dollars and go pay the state, 
that's a laborious process. I've got to check into 11 different exchanges around the world, and I have to monitor the exchanges to find out where I'm going to get my best price. Time, cost, everything associated with that. So by our, with our service, what we're offering the consumer is the ability to get the best average price at that given moment and immediately cash out their coins. We make our money in between. Do these 11 exchanges represent all the exchanges for Bitcoins or the biggest or what? Well, what we feel at this moment in time are the biggest and most secure exchanges. There's today over 50 different exchanges in the world and it's growing. And unlike a stock certificate, when you go sell an Apple stock, you know that if you go to Charles Schwab or you go to Merrill Lynch or you go to E-Trade, that price is the same in all cases within fractions of pennies. That's not true with the way the exchanges work today in cryptocurrency. They don't talk to each other. So the exchange price in China can be completely different than the exchange price of an exchange in the United States. So we connect our services to those to offer the best average price to the consumer. And what you're doing is you're hoping that the 11 that you select is representative of the whole? Well, we, we want it to be the best 11 that have the highest trading volume and the most secure systems because we're taking the risk at that point. So for the state in accepting cryptocurrency, and it shouldn't just be Bitcoin on the, on the bill, it should be cryptocurrency in general because Bitcoin five years from now might not be the coin that is the most dominant. And I, the way I look at Bitcoin is like Visa, Master, American Express. There's a processing system for credit cards that processes all those cards, including Discover Card. There are now today over 500 altcoins in the marketplace. Probably 10 really legitimate altcoins out there. We don't know which coin's gonna be the best, just like we didn't know if Discover would overtake American Express or Barclays is now gonna overtake American Express. You wanna put a processing system in place that handles the options. So you can bring in the most amount of customers that are using cryptocurrency, because that should be the goal. The goal should be we want customers not to give us credit card information anymore. You don't want the liability, you don't want the cost associated with it. The goal should be we want to move into getting our consumer base using cryptocurrency as the payment to the state, because the state will save a lot of money by doing so. Yeah, thank you for your detailed testimony on the <coughs> transactions and try to make an efficient market for the, for the currency. Uh, I want to go back to the testimony we heard last week about what is a Bitcoin and how do we convert that Bitcoin into cash. The testimony last week, uh, it was acknowledged that the Bitcoin is nothing more than a prize of solving a computer puzzle. Is that a fair summary? That's exactly right. Okay. So the market for Bitcoin and cash is the market for these prizes. If I had a prize for Bitcoin and I wanted to sell that prize, I would depend on a, a market that would have bidders to buy these coins uh, for whatever price it's going for. Would that be true? Correct. And if that market dries up for whatever reason, then the person with the Bitcoin would be in trouble trying to liquidate that. That would be that correct. Would be true, right? Yes. So isn't the state taking a risk by accepting a Bitcoin that there may not be a market at the time they want to sell it for cash? Now, the only risk that happens is, if, is in this case, to the consumer. Just like when a consumer buys gold or silver and they're betting that that's the place to put their, 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 uh, their worth, the same is true with Bitcoin or some of the others because the state actually never sees the coin. The way Zifter Pay works and some of the other transaction processes work is that the exchange is actually happening between the consumer and the exchange. And we facilitate that to the exchange and the exchange, the exchange or the processing system moves the exchange into cash into the state. So the state never, the state can always be at a zero flux of no risk because they're always accepting cash at the second that the transaction happens. If the state wanted to get speculative, like some retailers have, Overstock, for example, takes Bitcoins today. They've made a public statement they hold 10% of that monetary value when the, the service happens in Bitcoins, they take 90% in US dollars. That's their option, they chose to do that. Yeah, I think we can assume the state is fairly risk averse and they don't take gold bars, they want Federal Reserve notes. Um, 
So how would the state being very, very risk averse would get instantaneous payment from a credible source of funds that this money is indeed in the state's bank account at the time this uh, Bitcoin would have been transacted? Many of the exchanges we're seeing today, Coinbase being a good example of one, they've raised $124 million in the last 18 months, uh, were actually setting themselves up like banks. And so they're, the institutions and the people getting around them are looking at that. So the way to think about it is, is you have an exchange that is, is instantly moving the tokens into cash and you're receiving your cash from that institution just like you receive your cash from a credit card today. I mean, you're taking faith on MasterCard in the credit card processing system, First Data, for example, that they're going to cash that and you're going to get your batch process of cash at the end of the night and they have the facilities and the capital structure behind them to make sure that you get cashed out. It's the same, same process. Uh, I just wanted to follow up with but the process we're talking about with MasterCard and Visa is a process that cash came into those companies from <coughs> some source and that cash is going out to the state through a processor. By contrast, the Bitcoin is not a piece of cash, it's a computer price that has a market with bidders. And if there's any problem with that with the bids on a Bitcoin, that transaction would be very difficult to convert to cash. And that's my concern with the, uh, uh, with the Bitcoin. And so therefore, wouldn't it be simpler for all parties that people want to use Bitcoin, that's their right, and just come into the state with a little uh, device that says, look, I'm going to pay in Bitcoin, Here's my Bitcoin to dollar converter, and out of this dollar converter from a U.S. bank with uh, federal funds, the state can get their money. Is that system possible or practical? There, there's a couple systems we're actually working with today that I think follow what you're suggesting. Uh, we're working with a company that actually will allow us to link like a debit card to the actual consumer's wallet of Bitcoins. And so they can actually walk up into any terminal and use their debit card. And what happens back behind the scene with Ziftra Pay is that we'll move into their the wallet, which is an authorization to remove the 25 Bitcoins or whatever the number is. And then that will still get converted to cash. We still have to have an exchange somewhere in the middle that is, is going to, to sell the goods. So, um, yeah, it's just like any commodity. I mean, really, Bitcoin or any of these prizes are as a commodity the consumer has, and they're looking for places to be able to use and spend and convert that commodity. Um, and you can leave it that way. You can just leave it, let the consumer do that, let the consumer uh, sell it on their own, and we don't want to touch that. But the disadvantage you have on that is that I'm a consumer, I sold my Bitcoin, I got cash. Well, it's hard to walk in the state with cash and pay for anything. So that's when I move back to my credit cards. Now I'm gonna move the cash into a credit card, I'm gonna come back to the state and pay with the credit card. You've lost a huge opportunity to drop operating cost. And that's, that's really the advantage we have here is to embrace that and allow it to have, the state isn't taking any risk. There's a huge, adva and there's a huge advantage into um, seeing some operating costs dropped out of here. I think the other thing too is, just because the state decides to put processes in place to, to be able to, to facilitate the transactions of altcoins or bitcoins, doesn't mean this is going to happen overnight. I'd be surprised if more than 5% of your total transactions in the first year were moved from credit cards to bitcoins. So it's going to be a process that happens, but the more you open up to it, the more it will start spreading, which should be the goal. Thank you. Um, Representative Lehman, followed by Representative Alvey, and Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One question and a, probably a follow-up with it. Um, and far be it for me to praise the IRS for anything, but does the IRS presently accept Bitcoins as payment for taxes? Not that I'm aware of. Why? That's the follow-up question. Why? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so far, the IRS has ruled that Bitcoin is a piece of property. And there's lots of, of ongoing legislation and conversations happening about really what is Bitcoin or digital coin as a currency going to be classified as. Um, I think things are passing through the state of New York or 
are attempting to be might make some changes on some of those things. Um, I think we all as as a legislative body continue to look at this and and understand what technology can be built around it. So how can we classify it at some point? I would I would be surprised if we see more states start accepting Bitcoin. I spoke in front of the New Jersey House uh, about three weeks ago that we don't start seeing some changes in the IRS also. Uh, Thank you. Um, if okay, I'm I've got bitcoins. I have a five thousand dollar tax bill from the state of New Hampshire. On um, I go through you, and you take my my order and you send out to get, I need $5,000 of U.S. currency, uh, how many bitcoins is it going to cost to 11 exchanges? You pick, you charge me the middle one, but you, you pick the, the highest bidder. And is the exchange a bank? I, under, I remember hearing last week that some of them are actually parts of banks, but is it would they have to be registered as a bank in order to be, be exchanges? Because and are they the ones that are going to take the U.S. the five thousand dollars and send it to the state? It's a great question. Um, so, and to your point, some of the exchanges in the marketplace are starting to set themselves up as 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 registering like a bank. Um, there is. Um, ambiguity in the current MSB laws around what ex uh, money transfer laws around what an exchange has to do and where they're going to go. Uh, the ones that we use in the U.S., we use two, um, have followed more of the money transmitter laws and are acting and looking like that they want to move into that state. Um, so yes, the exchange that ultimately end of the day is the repository and that's where um, the cash receipts are going to be funded from is from the exchange, not from ZipterPay. ZipterPay is really acting as the technology of, of API or, or intermediary levels to make the processes work quickly. So from the consumer point of view, they can get their Bitcoins in and out, and from the merchant point of view, in this case the state, can get their, their cash. So, if I could follow up. So, so none of these exchanges are actually parts of banks at this point, but they're somehow, our money transmittal laws are pretty severe at this point for everything else. They're somehow avoiding having to to deal with that so far? They're no, the, the exchanges like Coinbase and uh, another one we use is Cripsy, they're actually applying for or have the Received, I believe Coinbase made an announcement last week that they received their money transmission license in 28 states. So they're acting like they're moving down that process to be a money transmitter and applying to an appropriate license, even though the law is gray if they need to or not. And we're only working with companies like that. They're acting like a bank and have, have large backing. Before we get to the level, as a follow up to the so that five thousand dollar bill that needs to be paid to the state goes to an exchange. So okay, I want to convert my bitcoins to five thousand dollars. You give them the credit for the average of a you know, lot of them. But you can make your money by actually selling it to the highest. It's one way that Citrus Pay makes the money. We we have four different mechanisms we make money on. Well, there's in the marketplace, in the shopping marketplace, there's a thing called uh, affiliate fees when you're able to bring customers to different merchants. And so as we sign up merchants, the state's not a good example of this, but let's just say uh, Joe's Coffee down the road and they decide to bring on and accept Bitcoin. If we bring customers to them, they pay affiliate fees that range from 5 to 10%. So that's one way we make money. We make actually a lot of money today off Amazon. Amazon pays us 8% to bring customers to their doors. And then we make money in the marketplace also, market listings, 
on our website. So by helping merchants move e-commerce and bring consumers into it, they pay us different fees for doing it, just like advertiser fees. So that's, that's the fourth uh, we've got money trend, we've got the market maker, we've got the, oh, there also is a fee on credit cards. We actually have partnered with our system to not just take cryptocurrency, our system allows smaller merchants to get out PCI compliance. We partner with WorldPay, the second largest, third largest credit card processor in the world, to our systems to be able to accept credit cards. So as a consumer, we're tired of the targets and the Home Depots and our credit card information is stored on our systems. Our systems allow the merchant not to store the credit card information, and your credit card is then tokenized and moved directly to the credit card processor, and we make a fee for that service also. So you as a chain would not want the state to hold Bitcoin, so you want to involve with Bitcoin so that you can work between the customer that buys and that sells it. We want to help facilitate the use of cryptocurrency. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Um, very interesting. Um, two questions, if I could. To um, to, to peg off of Representative Almi's question about the five thousand dollar tax bill. Um, so she makes that payment. And we do the Bitcoin uh, uh, deal. It goes to the exchange. Can you help us understand? Um, where there is no risk, number one, um, how long till the state gets the money? And who actually makes that payment to the state? And how is there no risk? There's, there's got to be some sort of risk breakdown. Show us how there is no risk to this. Okay. Um, so today, for example, if you take a, a credit card, um, a third party processor has said, yes, we think that credit card's good, go ahead and make the transmission. And the credit card processor at that point has, has, has charged the card um, and has moved monetary funds between the processor and whatever the bank was that issued the card. At the end of the day, you're getting a batch process to the state for that credit card. So you have cash now. You still have a follow-on process if the credit card actually was stolen or went bad that you as the state, as the merchant in this case, are liable for that. Credit card companies still come back and say, you know what, that wasn't good. Your five thousand dollar bill that you showed uh, isn't paid. There also is chargebacks and other things. So there's risk with credit cards all day long. With cryptocurrency, it works almost exactly the same way. To the user, instead of pressing Mastercard, they've pressed Pay with Zifter Pay. Pick your cryptocurrency. I want to use Bitcoin. Here's $50 worth. We show the current average price. The user clicks go. At that point, everything looks like a credit card. The state got their information on what they paid. The Bitcoin was immediately sold on an exchange. The exchange, at the end of the night, batch processes your cash to the state. So if there's a risk, the risk would be at the exchange point where they have the capital and the infrastructure to make sure that you're getting paid your, your cash at the end of the night. But there's no chargeback. And there's no fees associated with that. Um, and as, this, as the technology and the industry grows, the exchanges are going to get bigger and bigger with more and more capital backing. And just two years ago, Coinbase didn't exist. They now have $170 million in capital backing from VCs, and they're backed by Silicon Valley Bank. So things have happened in a very rapid period of time will continue to have a, a, a rapid period of time. We have 10 minutes left. I'd like to get on to the last card. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And by the way, I forgot to thank you before for your testimony this morning. Um, there are other states that are currently accepting Bitcoin. Uh, if so, could, it would be nice, I think, if we could find out from them directly how their experience has gone so far so we could relate it to New Hampshire. Would you be willing to provide that information? Yeah, yeah, so I would be willing to help provide that and work with some representatives here to, to talk to the other states. Great question. Thank you. I made a mistake. I have two cards, so thank you for testing. Thank you. <coughs> Next is Will Anderson, the state of Columbia, New Hampshire, representing South. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, everyone, for 
hearing my testimony, which should be brief. Um, you heard uh, testimony from Representative Schlein and others last week that New Hampshire, one of the reasons why New Hampshire should allow um, people to pay fees and taxes in Bitcoin is that New Hampshire is one of the largest Bitcoin hubs in the country. And I just wanted to provide some concrete evidence of that. Um, Overstock.com, which is one of the largest companies that um, currently accepts Bitcoin, um, recently re released some statistics on their number of Bitcoin orders. And New Hampshire has far and away the largest number of orders per, um, per resident. Um, it's actually 47% uh, more than the second highest, which is Utah. And um, if you, I don't know if you can see this, um, all the other states just like trail off, but New, New Hampshire is significantly ahead of the other states in the number of Bitcoin orders. Um, and that's pretty much it. I just wanted to provide some evidence that of the amount of Bitcoin usage in New Hampshire. Can you leave that with us? Yes, I can. Any, thank you for your testimony. Do you accept questions? Yes. Just a quick clarification. Sure. That's per capita. Yes, that's per capita. That's per capita. Yeah, this okay. is this is actually um, orders per million residents. Orders per million residents. Yes. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, thank you for your testimony. Okay. Next is a Dennis Rice, uh, Hampton Ball, and support. <laughs> Pardon me, Mr. Chairman. I'm representing myself, and I'm also uh, on the International Technology Law Association, and I'm speaking to that association in San Diego in a couple of months on Bitcoin. Uh, I'm a resident of Hampton Falls, having just moved to Hampton Falls from California about 12 months ago. Uh, to speak to Representative Almy's question about what states have done, I want to just parenthetically mention that uh, last summer, California passed and the governor signed a bill that makes Bitcoin legal for any kind of purchasing activities by striking from Section 107 of the Corporations Code a requirement that only lawful tender of the United States be used in commercial transactions. So that was a step forward. Um, I think other states might uh, follow. The reason I'm here actually is that I was doing some homework on Friday to get ready to uh, for the uh, speaking in San Diego uh, at the end of uh, April. And I saw this thing on Google about this bill being introduced here in New Hampshire. And I thought, my God, uh, this New Hampshire could be at the advent, could be in the leadership of the move to uh, introduce cryptocurrency to more widespread use. And so I, uh, great thing about New Hampshire, I'm like, California is that you can find who your local representative is, who's on committees and so forth, you can email them. So I sent an email out figuring I'm you know, here back in a couple of weeks. Next thing I know, I got a phone call from uh, Representative Schlein saying, do you want to appear before the committee on Monday or Tuesday? I didn't even know there was a committee considering the bill, so this is very exciting for me. I've been speaking all over the world starting in August at the American Bar Association meeting in San Francisco, where I've been practicing law for 55 years. Then Bangalore, India, in January of last year. Then Melbourne, Australia, February of last year. Then New York City. My poor wife has had to put up with all this. Um, but the, the, the thing is, all over the world, there's ATMs in Canberra, Australia, dispensing Bitcoin. All over the world, there's interest in this cryptocurrency. And when I saw that, my newly adopted state 
why I'm a registered voter in Hampton Falls, is considering a bill of this magnitude, I thought, my God, uh, this is really something. This is really something. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the new book that's out by Michael J. Casey and Paul Vigna called The Age of Cryptocurrency, How Bitcoin and Digital Money Are Challenging the Global, global Economic Order, which just is, came out this year. But they state in there, and I'm quoting, Bitcoin is much more than a currency. It is a radically new, decentralized system for managing the ways societies exchange value. It is quite simply one of the most powerful innovations in finance in 500 years. And that's in the book by Casey and Digna. Now, it's a work in progress. Um, it's constantly being improved. It's open source and it's copyright free so people can be uh, accessing it and, and working on improvements. Uh, one well-known San Francisco venture capitalist who um, I will not name, but he's a client of mine. And his firm has invested over $50 million in Bitcoin startups. Uh, he estimates, quote, 10,000 of the best developers in the world are working on Bitcoin, unquote. And this is not a person who's not technologically knowledgeable. This person invented the mosaic system, which gave rise to what we now know as search mechanisms on the web. Um, If you read Casey and Vigna in the book, they contrast the credit card payment and Bitcoin payment by citing the example of buying a cup of coffee at your local coffee shop. If payment is made by credit card, the buyer swipes the card, grabs the cup, and leaves. But the financial system is just starting. Before the shop gets paid and the buyer's bank balance is debited, more than a half dozen institutions will have shared part of the buyer's account or otherwise inter intervened in the money flow. These include a billing processor, a card association like Visa, MasterCard, the buyer's bank, the coffee shop's bank, a payment processor, the clearinghouse network man managed by the Federal Reserve Bank. If all goes well, <coughs> if you buy the coffee, uh, your bank will confer will confirm his or her identity and good credit and send payment to the coffee shop's bank within two or three days. For this privilege, the coffee shop pays a fee of between two and three percent. That's on credit card deals. With Bitcoin, all that's done away with. The, the fees are either zero percent or less than one percent. That's the range. So this is great for merchants. That's why merchants love Bitcoin. Um, if the buyer pays in Bitcoin, it allows the buyer's embedded secret packers to embody a Bitcoin address, public inform the Bitcoin computer network, the buyer's transferring $1.75 worth of Bitcoin, which uh, this past year was about 0, 0, 0.0076 Bitcoin uh, to the coffee shop's address, and that all takes just seconds. For the merchant to get paid. Now, um, Mr. Rice, we yes, have, we have just a couple of minutes left. So if you could okay. Um, what I want to say, what I want to point out is that uh, cryptocurrency, uh, electronic use of money is not new and it's expanding. Um, in Sweden, for example, 95% of all transactions are done without cash. In the United States, most transactions between companies and otherwise, 93% are cashless. They're electronically done. So this is not something that's totally new. What is new is that the people, uh, retail, at the retail level, are going to be using this device. Um, I want to read one thing that, just let me read this one thing up. 
stated, it was in the New York Times last January, Mark Andreessen, <coughs> Andreessen Horowitz, quote, a mysterious new technology emerges seemingly out of nowhere, but actually the result of two decades of intense research and development by nearly anonymous researchers. Political idealists project visions of liberation and revolutions onto it. Establishment elites heap scorn and contempt on it. On the other hand, technologists, nerds, are transfixed by it. They see within it enormous potential and spend their nights and weekends tinkering with it. Eventually, mainstream products, companies, industries emerge to commercialize it, its effects become profound, and later, many people wonder why its powerful promise wasn't more obvious from the start. What technology am I talking about? Personal computers in 1975, the internet in 1993, and, I believe, Bitcoin in 2014. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Saying none, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else wish to testify for or against House Bill 2-FN? What happened to the cards that uh, were filed on Thursday? Because I turned one in on Thursday. As did I. What is your name? Daryl Perry. Yes, uh, I am opposed to the bill. With all due respect to Representative Schlein and the other Bitcoin supporters, uh, I'm a Bitcoin supporter myself, but I am opposed to this bill, uh, mainly because of the deadlines that are in place, and I know how great the state is at keeping deadlines. Uh, you may recall it was about two years ago when the therapeutic cannabis bill went through and there are all kinds of deadlines that the state has not met on implementation of therapeutic cannabis. Uh, this bill before you implements two deadlines. One deadline for presenting a plan that would identify appropriate third-party payment processor that will accept Bitcoin with no transaction cost to the state. I'm a little unclear what would happen if the state is unable to identify a third payment or third party payment processor on or before January 1st of 2017. And then there's the requirement that the state begin accepting it in July of 2017. So again, I, I'm a little unclear of what happens if a third payment processor or third party payment processor cannot be found. Also, there was the question about uh, will the IRS accept Bitcoin as payment for taxes? And the answer is no. The IRS also will not accept gold or silver for payment of taxes. The state of New Hampshire will not accept gold or silver for payment of taxes. And where does this end? Will, will we go down this slippery slope to anything of value and then could I take a carton of eggs to pay my $5 parking ticket? Uh, there are contradictory regulations at the federal level regarding Bitcoin. The IRS says it's property. FinCEN says it's money. The FEC says that it's an in-kind contribution. Uh, there's been a lot of testimony about making it easier to pay and collect taxes and fees. I don't want it to be easy for collection of fees. The last fee that I paid, I went in with $35 of pennies and I sat there until they accepted the pennies. I was threatened about three times with the rest by the bailiff, claiming that pennies are not currency. Uh, he said, pennies are money, but it says up here that they only take cash or credit card or check. And pennies aren't cash, so therefore get out of here or you're gonna be arrested. And I said, I'll stay and wait until they take my pennies. 
So I don't want it to be easier for people to take money from me. Uh, and as the gentleman from ZifterCoin pointed out, there are many other alternative, or uh, rather cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin. So if you are going to pass this, then at least have the decency to amend it to say virtual currencies or any other currency. And then I can give you a Canadian $5 bill to pay my parking ticket. Uh, I'll take any question, but uh, just know that as an avid Bitcoin supporter and a small business owner that only accepts Bitcoin, I am opposed to the state of New Hampshire accepting Bitcoin. Thank you for your testimony. Questions from many, many members? Anybody else wish to testify for or against House Bill 5? I had a card in last week. My name is Christopher Cantwell. I'm from Keene. I'm, I'm for the bill. Right. You had testified last week. Last week, I different different bill. Oh, no. oh, that was a different bill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've spoken before this committee before, but not on this particular issue. Okay, um, Mr. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I'm a I'm a writer and a talk show host. I spent a great deal of time discussing economics and Bitcoin in particular. Um, Bitcoin is, as a result, a considerable portion of my income. Uh, I live in Keene, and in Keene there's a number of businesses over there where I can spend Bitcoin directly, and I infinitely prefer shopping at those businesses over an otherwise identical product or service, and there's, there's a number of reasons for that. When I accept Bitcoin from my advertisers and my contributors, uh, I do not use a payment processor to convert them into dollars because I expect the value of Bitcoin to go up over time. I'm betting, that, I'm betting on Bitcoin, okay? And so I, I hold my Bitcoin for as long as I possibly can. I'm not terribly interested in holding dollars because we all know that dollars are going down over time and the expectation is that Bitcoin will go up because there's, not, there's, a, there's a limited number of Bitcoins. Um, so when I, I don't want to part with those Bitcoins until I absolutely have to make the payment. It's, it's preferable for me to... Uh, uh, part with them when I'm buying something. If I were to, uh, a couple of people had asked why we don't just convert our Bitcoins into dollars and then pay, well because if you're not regularly converting Bitcoins into dollars, it's like kind of clunky to do that, if you will. If the state is going to be accepting Bitcoin, they set up a, a payment processor like Zipter Coin or BitPay, and then it's, it's very streamlined. You guys don't even once this is set up, you're never, you're never going to know the difference. I know the difference because I'm not regularly doing that. I'm not plugged into all of these exchanges and watching these things go up and down. I, I infinitely prefer to be able to buy a thing with Bitcoin or in this case have some money extracted from me by the state. It just makes life a lot easier and there's a growing number of people like me in this state who hold Bitcoins. That we want to use that as our currency as, as much as possible. and. The more people, the, the easier that is for people in New Hampshire, the more Bitcoin entrepreneurs you're going to get into this state. And, and a gentleman had asked uh, what the benefit is for the state. And, and it's just an overall improvement in your economy. If Bitcoin users are going to feel welcomed here and if they're going to be able to do business here uh, more easily and it's easier for them to deal with the state when they, are, when they must do so, uh, that's going to encourage Bitcoin users to come to this place. It's going to encourage them to do business here, and it's going to be excellent for the economy here. And I'll take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the representative? Yeah, I'll just quickly thank you. Though. Just theoretically, when Bitcoin was about eight hundred thirty-five dollars, and now I think as of Friday it's around two fifty. So if you're using Bitcoin to pay for service, when it's at a lower rate, you're using more Bitcoins. Yeah, I mean, just like uh, just like any other exchange rate. So, I mean, Bitcoin had gone up to 800 and at some point I think it actually hit $1,200, right? I got into Bitcoin originally when it was lower than that, right? So, I mean, when, when it was up there, it was very preferable for me to go out and spend Bitcoins. But I knew, but as, a, as an economist, I look at that and I say that when Bitcoin goes from, you know, $200 to over $1,200, I say speculative bubble, don't buy that right now, right? So I mean, there's. Uh, I'm happy to spend it, but I'm not. I'm not looking to, you know, go on an exchange and buy Bitcoin at twelve hundred dollars. I'm looking for that, for that um, return to mean. 
right? That's a it's a speculative bubble when it goes up like that, and then I, and then it comes down. It's not unexpected that it comes down like that. But yeah, so I'm gonna. Uh, if I'm going to buy something when Bitcoin is $800, then I'm clearly going to send out fewer monetary units to buy something than when it's at $200. Thank you. Any further questions? None. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Anybody else uh, wish to testify for or against House Bill 552? We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.